All right, everybody. My name is Brett Nyquist. I'm the director of technology for the plant-based nutrition support group. So thank you everybody who is joining us right now. There are some more people that will flood in, but thanks for being here. Um, just a couple of things I wanted to touch on before we pass it over to Paul and Joel. Um, we do have a good list of virtual events coming up. Uh, one being Neil Bernard on July 22nd. Uh, that will be at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and you can register for that on our website, which is pbnsg.org. Um, and then we also have three more classes left of our um, culinary virtual series. Um, it's a series we are doing right now with our co-director um, of culinary education, Vicki and Michelle Gallo. So if you are interested in learning some good cooking tips for plant-based nutrition, you can also register for those on our website. I appreciate you being here. Thank you so much, Brett. So yep. um, uh, first of all, hello, everybody. Everyone at one point, let's go one, two, three, we'll say hello to, to Joel. One, two, three. Hello, Joel. Hello, Joel. Hello, Joel. Hello. All right, this was really a test to see if everyone was muted. Good job. Appreciate it. <laughs> ah. uh, I, you know, it's it's men's night. Now, I'm, I'm seeing mostly men, but I do see some ladies. So I want to welcome the ladies for men's night, but I must say that because it's men's night, I did prepare five jokes for men. I can't tell four of, four of them because it might be upsetting to some ladies, but I'm going to tell you one to start the show and then we're going to, I'm going to share a little bit about my story for those who have never met me. And then uh, we're going to bring it over to Joel. Joel's going to enlighten us with some knowledge as he always does. And then really, this is uh, as much your meeting as it is ours. There's a lot of people who have a lot of questions, and we want to take the time to answer them. Yeah, Paul, so, before you, uh, let me just touch on the questions, too. If anybody has any questions, just ask them in the chat. And towards the end of the meeting, we will get to them the best we can and do a little Q&A session. Perfect. All right. So um, let's see. Ryan, you did hear what I asked for next week? I, I don't know, you know, I, I know that, uh, Ryan, you are a plant-based doctor. I'm so proud of you. You're young, and we've got plans for you. So please give me a call next week. All right, so here's my one joke. Oh, wait, is I, that to, to, to what, Dr. Ryan? Ryan Abu. Oh, Ryan right, Abu, because there is another plant-based doctor, Ryan Barish, that we thank. Welcome, Ryan Abu. But we do oh, want you, to you. also secure Dr. Ryan Barish into an active part in this group internally. Uh, it sounds like you've offered to help. Thank you, Joel. Yeah. Please. Okay. So um, I'm going to just warn everybody. So Mary, Elaine, Linda, Meta, and Deborah. I apologize. This is an R-rated joke. I usually have only PG jokes, but it's men's night. Uh, so here we go. I'm going to be in trouble for this one. Yes, I don't approve. Why do penises have a hole at the end? Hmm. I know the answer. Of course, <laughs> I told you the joke. To get some sunshine on the brain. No. Why no. do men have holes at the end of their penis? Why do penises have a hole at the end? So men could be open-minded. Okay, we were there. We were pretty close on that one. We are pretty close. Pretty All right. Close. Okay, now... Uh, that's my only joke. The other ones, you could send me an email and I'll be glad to share them with you because I do deep research into the jokes, as you could tell through the years. So my name is Paul Chatlin. I'm the founder of the Plant-Based Nutrition Support Group. You know, we are an organization that has been going well and strong with now over 7,300 members uh, for over six years. The mission is simply nutrition before pills and procedures. This all started with, and I'll, I'll go through this very briefly, uh, miracles that happened to me seven years ago where I was so fortunate to uh, be able to go to the Cleveland Clinic the day before I was supposed to have a biopsy and a heart catheter at Beaumont. I was assigned a doctor who's a head of heart transplant because that's what they thought I needed. But as he was cheering the fact that I didn't need a heart transplant, but rather immediate bypass surgery, I was received another miracle because right at that, right at the door of surgery, and trust me, I was scared and I was worried. I kept saying to myself, just breathe, wake up, all those things. 
he stopped the gurney and said, would you consider a nutritional change? Now, I must admit to everybody, I didn't know what nutrition was seven years ago. I, I, I kind of thought it was skim milk or eating more fruits, but I didn't know what it really meant. But I agreed to something because I didn't want to have surgery. I didn't want to have surgery because my dad and all his brothers died in their 50s from heart disease. I've got three sons and I'm just whacked out enough that I would try anything to not have the surgery. So the next day I talked to Dr. Esselstyn and it has been over seven years, the last time I ate meat, dairy and oil. The most important thing is I made a solemn promise. Uh, the promise was I wanted to give back because I felt I was so lucky to have this moment with a doctor who gave me a, the chance of a lifetime to change my life without surgery that I know that other people didn't know about it. So I wanted to share that uh, with, with as many people as I could starting right here where I grew up and I love and live in Michigan. So here I was thinking, okay, what am I going to do? Well, I want to share with you, at the time that I needed, I met the doctors for the first time, my cholesterol was 347. I know, that's where everyone gasps. I can't believe it. I weighed 236 pounds at that time. Well, let me fast forward. Today, through the help of my great cardiologist, Dr. Joel Kahn, I, my cholesterol number is 88. And if you can see... I only weigh 167 pounds, okay? I feel great. I'm a product of the 70s, so I tried everything I could during those times. And the best drug I've ever had is plant-based nutrition because I'm on high energy from early in the morning to late at night every single day, and I'm never sore. I feel great. And the organization, by the way, was just a heart organization. Interesting uh, story. You know, I never knew Dr. Joel Kahn seven years ago. I did not know who he was. I never heard of him. But what I did is I went to the heads of three hospitals and I said, can you give me a name of a holistic cardiologist? They gave me three names, each one of them. One name was repeating and that was Dr. Joel Kahn. I figured, well, since his name was repeating, I'd call him first. So I called him up. I said, hey, I want to start a support group, but I'm not a doctor. I know you're a, a holistic cardiologist. This guy said, hey, come on over. Like I'm thinking, well, that's pretty nice. He invited me over. Nice house, Joel. And um, you did well for yourself. And Thank you, sir. we spent four hours together. I never made a call to the other doctor. I want to admit this in front of everybody. He is my brother, and I love Joel Kahn. He's been there for me each step of the way, and uh, he's more than a friend. He's a, <laughs> he is my brother. Don't ask me who I care more about, Brett or Joel or my dog. Okay? Wow. You can throw your blood on. I tell you what, when my problem. when my computer's down, it's definitely Brett. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> when I'm having computer problems, it's totally Brett. Let me tell you. All right, so so I invited Joel to join me. We started at, at Beaumont. We had you know I think what was it 123 people it went to 147. I'm going to fast forward. The organization, as I said, has 7,300 members. This year, we had a big lofty plan to expand nationally in a big way but we only wanted certain hosts because our group is only as strong as our small groups. We have some 54 small groups all dotted all over Michigan, but we've expanded into Ohio, Indiana. We're in uh, Massachusetts now, New York, California, but we have to have specific type of host. The host has to be whole food plant-based. The host has to be a doctor, a nurse practitioner, a nurse, a nutritionist, a dietitian. So we're not just opening up to anybody. We're opening up to people who will be committed for the long term because we're committed to them for the long term. This organization has a lot of classes, a lot of different speaker events. We are a group of non-judgmental people. I recognize that for me, I couldn't take seven steps without stopping and grabbing my chest. I made a switch to plant-based nutrition and within 14 days, my taste buds changed. I, my angina went away. And things just started getting better and better. Now, I will tell you, it's amazing the strength of food. Because seven years, I still think of certain foods. Like, I still kind of wish I had a pizza. I still wish I had a piece of chocolate. I will admit to everybody, I did have a piece of chocolate one day in seven years. 
I will freely say that for the first three and a half minutes, I loved it. And by the way, just so people will ask, what chocolate was it? I took 10 Hershey Kisses. I put them all in my mouth at the same time. I looked like I was a big squirrel. I let it just kind of melt, melt, melt. When it was gone, I could rub my cheeks. I was so happy. That night, I was doubled over in pain for three hours. Mm. Last time I had chocolate, I'll never have it again. But I do miss these things. But here's what I don't miss. What I don't miss is weighing 237 pounds. What I don't miss is a cholesterol number of 347. And what I really don't miss is knowing that if I didn't make a change, I'd have a 10 inch scar on my chest and I'd be 10, 12 years away from another surgery. So every time I get tempted, I check myself and realize what is important to me. Saying all those things, if I have, uh, we, we made some changes last year. I stepped down as the chairman of the board of PBNSG and Dr. Robert Brakey is the chairman of the board. Dr. Khan is our medical director. Uh, I stepped down as the uh, uh, chief executive officer, as well as the person who ran the organization day to day. And Lisa Smith is now taking over the duties. And I would like to invite everybody to meet Lisa. She's brilliant. She's smart. She's running this organization like a business because with 7,300 people, it has to be run like a business. My problem is I just like saying yes to everybody. So that's not a good way to run a business. Um, but I'm a good friend and that's what matters to me. Uh, so these are the changes within the organization, but please get involved. And if you wanna, can't get involved, maybe it's time to donate. You know, just to let you know, our organization, 90% of the income comes into PBNSG between February and June. Well, what happened between February and June this year? We didn't have any meetings. Now, thank goodness these virtual meetings has helped us. But we want to be a viable organization with this when this virus ends. So if anybody can make any kind donations, I want to say ahead of time, thank you so much. But just as important as, as donations is volunteer. So if you want to volunteer to help us, we could always use qualified, committed volunteers. I want to thank everybody for being here today. I'm available at paul at pbnsg.org. So if you have questions, let me know. My goal for next year, just to let everybody know is, I want to get more involved on the psychology side of change. So in a few minutes, Joel's going to start talking. But I want to ask this question. What is holding people back? I talk to people every single day, I don't know, five to 10 people every day. And they're so close. And some of them are so far. But they can conceptualize the importance of it. They can understand what they need to do. But when it comes down to it, is it peer pressure? Is it laziness? Is it what? I don't know what it is, but there's something that holds people back time and time again. And my challenge to you is you could do anything for 60 days. You hear these jump starts, 14, 21 day jump starts. Uh -uh. Go 60 days. Here's what's going to happen in 60 days. You'll lose 20 pounds. Your cholesterol number will drop. Your taste buds will change and you'll feel great. And maybe that's what you need to feel is truly what a plant-based would be like on you. And then how could you want to do anything but stay plant-based? I don't know the answer, but that's something I want to talk to Ryan about is I want to understand a little bit more of the psychology of what is holding people back from making this change as opposed to getting old and suffering. I want to enjoy my grandkids. I want to enjoy the rest of my life. And it means that I'm going to have to make tough choices. And tough choices are I can't have meat, dairy, and oil. That's it. Okay, that's it. If I never worked out, if I just gave up meat, dairy, and oil, I'm good. I want to welcome everybody here today. We've got a nice group. I've been very blessed and honored, as I said, to have a brother named Joel Kahn, Dr. Joel Kahn. You know, he's just an amazing, smart person, and he is going to wow us right now. So, Joel, jump on board. And then if people have, I see the questions are coming in. And, Brett, when Joel's done, Let's work our way through the questions. And if anybody has something, just kind of raise your hand or interrupt. I don't even care. It's men's night. So right. Interrupt. That's what guys do. And um, I'd love to hear what you have to say. Thank you, everybody. Wow. Everybody, even if you're muted, woo, even woo, if you're muted, woo, do woo. silent clapping. Absolutely. <laughs> and um, with a joke like that, you could take over Jimmy Kimmel for the summer here, Paul. There's a spot open. Uh, I, I, I would like that. 
Yeah, it was, uh, I knew where that was going. A little sunshine has to get on the brain. Well, thank you for the kind words. They were beyond uh, necessary. I am excited. We are seeing some uh, nice questions coming in. I hope there's more. I just want to run through, um, I'm not going to talk about my story. I'm going to talk about It's Men's Health Month. And just maybe from a medical scientific point, uh, just what Paul says, what holding people back. It's you know rarely the scientific database. It is more spouses, um, cooking knowledge, concerns about cost, uh, some deep-rooted psychological issues about mama's cooking, and all kinds of things that hold people back. And as you know, perhaps Dr. Ornish would say, it's finding that why. You know, if it's grandkids or you know seeing a uh, you know, a relationship blossom at all, you know, you find your why. Like Paul just said, he's found his why. Dairy, meat, and oils allow him to uh, lead a quality of life. That's really second to none. So uh, Paul is, uh, you know, it's exciting. I, I still get excited to hear Paul speak because that is the reason I do what I do. And not everybody has had the conviction to hang on. So I'm going to go from top to just below the waist with Men's Health Month. Uh, some brand new data and some, you know, most of you will know, but I just want to bring it up again. Number one, let's talk about brain health, men and brain health. And we're not talking about the brain that Paul said has a breathing hole, uh, like a, a whale. We're talking about the brain. And, you know, one of the issues, apparently Dr. Ornish is about to embark on a randomized study of his lifestyle heart trial, which is arguably 98.9% .9 completely whole food plant-based and it is no oil. Um, uh, we will let him in our group and we'd have him speak at our conference if he frankly didn't have such a high speaker's fee. Uh, maybe we can cut through that now with Zoom and uh, get him to speak to us uh, without a high speaker's fee. I'd be happy to reach out and see if we can arrange that, Paul. Uh, hey, everybody. Go ahead. I can't hear you. Everybody heard oh. that Joel's going to reach out to Dean Ornish yeah. because I want to let everybody know, we have seen every single person on the planet, they've come to PBNSG, and the only one is Dean Ornish. Right. And the and reason you know, is his speaker yeah. fee. His speaker and fee I'll is just, enormous. But yeah, I'll tell you a, 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 a quick funny story on that. I talked to his people, and he said, well, the speaker fee is 40000 Right. So I said, here's my response. I said, bite me. I said, $40,000? Are you kidding me? I mean, you know, Colin Campbell was – a thousand, you know what I mean? So, but, but, uh, so I can't make that call to Dean Orange's people anymore, but thank you, Joel. No, no I, I text with them all the time. All right, but let's start at the top. Apparently Dr. Ornish is going to do a formal randomized study on brain health. You know, there is dementia. You can substitute the word Alzheimer's dementia in honor of a German physician in 1906 that first described in a complete way, a patient that seemed to have had dementia. Um, not all of it really is Alzheimer's, but it's a big fear for a lot of us. If we get past heart disease and get past cancer, uh, are we gonna lose our memory and you know, quality of life goes down? And you know, is there plant-based data? And you know, Dr. Neil Bernard wrote a nice book about uh, brain health and whole food plant-based diets, I'd say about eight, nine years ago. And, Honestly, I'm blinking on the name of the book, but I remember a beautiful graphic that describes all the components of a whole food plant-based diet and odds of improved brain health. It's still controversial. He often quoted a study called the Chicago Healthy Aging Study that, although not a completely vegan study, lower saturated fat, better long-term brain health. There also is some data, the lower your body weight, the better the long-term brain health. And on average, not in every case, people that really commit the really good, no SOS, whole food plant-based diets, tend to maintain a lower body weight, as Paul just described his own personal experience. So this week in a major medical journal is a follow-up of the Chicago Healthy Aging Study and another database from Rush University where Dr. Kim Williams practices, but this was neurology data. And they had a couple thousand people that did not have brain memory impairment. They didn't meet the criteria for Alzheimer's. They didn't meet the criteria. There's something just before Alzheimer's called mild cognitive impairment. But you're starting to be forgetful. You're starting to be worried about this problem. Uh, maybe mild cognitive impairment. 
and they looked at in this database, this is like all epidemiology, a lot of questions. And in follow-up, a sizable proportion, like 25% of the group in follow-up, did develop criteria for dementia. And they looked at, did people do five habits or zero habits and you know across the spectrum? The habits were something called, and you may never have heard of this, there is a diet called the MIND diet, M-I-N-D. It's sort of a mix of the DASH diet, the Mediterranean diet. What do they talk about? Don't eat fried food, don't eat added sugar, don't eat red meat, uh, cut back on your dairy, get green leafies every day, get berries every day, get whole grains every day, get legumes and beans every day. They do mention a little fish and a little turkey because it wasn't designed to be like Dr. Esselstyn and Dr. Ornish and Dr. Bernard. Uh, it was just a, a free range public database. And if you adhere to, I don't smoke, I follow the mind diet. I exercise 25 minutes a day. It's not crazy. If I drink, I drink a drink a day, not six a day. And actually, the, the one a day was not a bad habit for brain health. And the last one was I play some mind games. Could be puzzles, could be Sudoku, uh, could be you know anything that really stimulates you. Ping pong by reputation is an extremely good brain game. Uh, activity. But the people that did five versus the people that did zero had 60% less brain issues over the course of the study. So if you're a guy and you're worried about family history of brain health or your own personal issues of memory, you know, eat beans, eat peas, eat lentils, eat whole grains, eat berries, eat leafy greens, um, cut back on saturated fat, which is going to be dairy and croissants and cheese and red meats, just as the study described. I wouldn't add in fish and poultry, um, but you know the data mentioned it. I certainly wouldn't do it. There's no reason to believe they're helpful. They just didn't ask people to give them up. And then you know, get your exercise, don't smoke, uh, you know, do some brain games, and uh, don't overdo alcohol or don't do it at all. Some of the other data out there is good sleep, seven hours of sleep versus five hours. If your significant other or your neighbor's three blocks away, say you snore, you probably should do something called a home sleep apnea study. You don't have to necessarily go to the fancy expensive lab anymore. You wear a little rock star watch on your hand and it tells you it's something you got to get from a medical office, but uh, get checked. So brain health, men's health um, is totally consistent. And, you know, it's always very similar to the program to prevent and reverse heart disease, prevent and reverse type 2 diabetes. Uh, optimal weight. Uh, the lifestyle is still the king. It may not be everything, but it's still the king. And everything else is, or we should be gender neutral. It's still the primary path to good brain health. Let's move down to the heart. Really, uh, you know, we, we could talk forever on it. I don't want to. Um, a number of people clearly logged on have a known heart situation. I still always plea that's an example of what's called a heart calcium CT scan. Now, Brett's only 29 years old. Brett doesn't probably need a heart artery calcium scan. Uh, and I don't Joel, I'm going to jump in. I actually got one down here just because I was curious. I don't know why. They looked at me like I was kind of crazy. Yeah. But uh, I got a zero. So. Okay. And was your pap smear okay? <laughs> yeah. Pap smear. <laughs> well, I would, that, that, I, that's men's night. Okay, I, I wouldn't do that again for about a decade, Brett. You're a little young, unless you really you have some un unusual family history. Or family history. Yeah. yeah, but didn't they have that, Dr. Khan, didn't they have that study with the, the bodies of the dead soldiers coming back from wow. Vietnam that showed scarring in their arteries even though they were young? That's a, it's an excellent question. So there actually were three studies like that since you asked. There was the Korean veterans, not veterans, soldier study, uh, unfortunate 23-year-old dies in a bomb blast in Korean War autopsy. About 70 to 80 percent of the soldiers like that had some atherosclerosis, and 20 percent had pretty significant atherosclerosis in their early 20s of the heart. Silent. So you could argue, well, if that's the case, why was Brett so uh, so wrong to necessarily get a CT scan at age 29? But then they did it in Vietnam and then they did it in Desert Storm. Actually, the numbers went down dramatically for finding atherosclerosis and severe atherosclerosis. Some people argue smoking rates have dropped dramatically since Vietnam. Availability of blood pressure and cholesterol treatments have dropped. You know, we know the food situation hasn't improved. 
but um, certainly it would be aggressive to tell most 30 year olds you know, to take a radiation exposure, even though it's a small radiation exposure. But if you're 40, 45, 50, and you're online, or you know somebody you care about, you know, I just had a patient today, $75, Providence Hospital, $99, St. Joseph Mercy, Ann Arbor, Beaumont's 125, uh, St. Joe's, Oakland. I mean, it takes about, I did mine about three months ago. I hadn't done it for 10 years. I was a zero again which is a pretty sweet thing when you're 61 years old, but you don't really want to know that your LED is totally calcified like the yellow air, but you would rather know than find out in an emergency room. So, you know, and the only other statement with heart and some of the people online are familiar with this. This is a promotional moment and I apologize. I did publish my sixth book in March. It's called Lipoprotein Little A. It's a genetic cholesterol. If you know yours is elevated, you probably should have your kids get theirs checked. It's just a simple blood test. But one out of every four people walk around with a gift from their parents they wish they didn't have, which is a cholesterol that can scar your heart arteries and scar your um, heart valves too. It's an unusual, unusual kind of cholesterol. And we're just learning how to treat it. There's a lot of pharmaceutical interest in it. But one out of every four people, so that you know, could be eight, nine, ten people just logged on today, have an elevated lipoprotein little a. So you know, test not guess. Anybody that follows me on social media knows how often I say that. Don't assume your heart's healthy. Of course, I'm talking to the group other than Brett, who now has confirmed that his heart's healthy uh, at age 29. But for most of us, we should do it once and maybe a decade later. If you've had bypass or stents, it's not the test to do. You already have a clue that there's a problem. Let's move down. Um, I'm going to go way down to the prostate. We have to mention prostate. Uh, prostate cancer remains a very big issue in men's health. Um, and you know, what can you do? Well, there is some controversy about whether you should get a prostate specific antigen PSA or not. A majority of doctors still do it. Some people feel we're finding such early, slow growing prostate cancers that we're just going to watch them anyways, but I think most urologists are still recommending it. It does clearly cause men a lot of concern if they find out their PSA is elevated because there are other causes. A little infection um, would be a common a reason it's elevated, and there's a lot of transient prostate infections. But, you know, and you probably want your primary care doc to put a finger on your prostate every now and then. Um, nobody's come up yet with an iPhone app that will do that for you, so you probably need to find a trained person to do that. But the important point is, you know, we do have in this world of whole food plant-based science, the three or four research papers by Dr. Dean Ornish, that while men, you know, and you, if you're not familiar, after he did the series of heart studies, the lifestyle heart trial, 1990, 1998, uh, he published a paper in 2005 with the urologists at University of California, San Francisco, 98 men, elevated PSA, biopsy proven prostate cancer. These 98 men have been told, you know what, it's early, we're gonna watch your prostate cancer, you're not rushing to prostatectomy, radiation, or advanced chemotherapy like um, uh, the drugs that you know, basically block all your testosterone. These were men being watched and he got permission, half of them, so about 49, adopted his heart program, but they were prostate cancer patients, not heart patients, and 49 were allowed to just follow with a urologist at a major medical center. And as you may know, but we haven't talked about it a lot at PBNSG that I recall, you know, within three months, the PSA went down if you're on a whole food plant-based diet and you're dealing with stress and exercise, and the PSA tends to go up over time in the control group. Um, they actually did MRI of the prostate tumors. They got a little smaller within three to six months, which is amazing. It wasn't chemotherapy. It was plant chemotherapy. And, you know, maybe the most dramatic, it's part of the research paper, actually two more dramatic. They actually took Petri dish of prostate cells and they would take the patient that was in this research study that was on a whole food plant-based diet and they dripped the blood on these prostate cancer cells. And it was eight times more powerful to kill prostate cancer cells. If you're eating leafy greens and beans and peas and lentils and fruit and whole grains, the blood of those people actually killed prostate cancer cells eight times more efficiently than the blood of the control group. It's literally like an amazing concept that there are people that argue we all have cancer cells in our blood almost every day. 
in our immune system can take them out and we don't develop clinical cancer. Well, Dr. You know, Ornish's data suggests that the diet that we teach at PBNSG <laughs> is indeed the ability to make your blood you know, an efficient chemotherapy. Crazy, amazing data. The last thing was, and some of you know the term epigenetics, that we're given our genetic gift from our parents in combination, but there's much more active control over our genomes. Some of you even know this, earthworms have more genes than humans. The Pinot Noir grape has more genes than humans. What the heck's with that? But humans have a much more elegant control system. Turn genes on, turn genes off. And in the Ornish study, he grabbed down the hall a Nobel Prize winning geneticist named Elizabeth Blackburn and asked her, you know, within three months of these 49 guys changing their diet, can we measure what's happened to their gene activity that's evolved with cancer? And you may be aware, but the genes that promote growth of cancer shut off and the genes that promote control and immune killing of cancer turned on within three months of changing your diet. I mean, this stuff should be on billboards. This stuff should be taught everywhere. Urologists don't even know that those papers exist and they're all in the urology journals. You know, those studies weren't really followed up with a book by Dr. Ornish. I think he does mention it in his newest book, Undo It. Um, most other plant-based docs don't really, you know, talk about it much. And there hasn't been much follow-up to it all, but talk about maintaining your prostate health. You know, whole food plant-based diets are going to rule the day. I just come up a little bit to the colon. You know, it's been uh, almost five years since the World Health Organization announced that processed meats, bacon, pepperoni, salami, corned beef, if any of you still long for those kind of foods, you know, not just associated, but actually cause colorectal cancer. Uh, guys suffer a lot from colorectal cancer, colostomies, all the procedures, the chemo, the radiation, and some, you know, die of the disease as it metastasizes. And it's, it's pretty darn clear that the risk of colorectal cancer, whether it's the fiber, and I'll give a shout out, I wish I had it with me. There is a new book out in the last four weeks called Fiber Fuel. Some of you may know that or not. If you're looking for a new book to read, a GI doc in uh, Char um, Savannah, Georgia, Will Bruschewitz, I just bastardized his name, an amazing guy, wrote a book about the value of whole food plant-based diets on your gut health. Um, but it also translates to your risk of colorectal cancer. But guys should get a PSA, should get a digital rectal exam. You know, you should get a colonoscopy or the alternative, which is a stool sample called Cologuard. It's not the old, just is there blood in the stool? It's actually a genetic analysis to see if there's any cells and activity that suggests you've got some angry polyps in your colon. And men and women can get a Cologuard. Like if you're really healthy and you've had no colorectal cancer in your family, you might say, I don't want a colonoscopy, but at least do something. Ask your primary care doc for this uh, test, which is insurance covered called Colo, C-O-L-O-G-U-A-R-D. I've had three colonoscopies, the last two zero polyps. The first one had one polyp, which is I repeated it. I think it's a pretty simple procedure, but there is a risk. There's a risk that something goes wrong and they perforate your colon or you don't react well to anesthetic. So you're super risk, just do something. And then, you know, so we went colon, prostate, brain, heart, and then we got to end up at the lower brain that Paul was talking about, which is erectile dysfunction. And I don't know why. I think during the COVID quarantine, people with podcasts and YouTubes uh, were looking for content. I don't know how many darn uh, interviews I've done in the last three months. And it always centers around one way or another, talking about early clues to heart disease. How do you prevent Bob Harper dropping dead of a heart attack, but then, you know, being miraculously resuscitated and other people like James Gandolfini dropping dead and not being resuscitated. You know, and you're looking for clues because heart disease is just a strange disease. There's no symptoms until there's very advanced disease like Paul had. And you don't want to wait. You don't want to wait for any cancer until it's very advanced. You don't want to wait till dementia until it's very advanced. But the standard American model is wait till heart disease is so bad that you're in an emergency room or you can't play tennis anymore, you can't ride your bike. You know, that's not good. So, you know, one of the early clues, other than being like Brett, Brett's the leader now of early clue detection, which is uh, a heart CT scan. I'm not making fun of him, but uh, uh, I'll have him hold off a little bit on his next one. But, you know, an early clue is male erectile dysfunction. What are the stats? The stats on that are that about 40% of men at age 40 
have erectile dysfunction, the inability to penetrate and perform the act. 50% of men at age 50, 60% of men at age 60, 70% uh, of men at age 70. There's certainly some data to assist that whole food plant-based eaters are less prone. It's not really good data because it just hasn't been studied much. The Adventist Health Study, for example, Blue Zones data, Ornish data. I mean, of course, Dr. Esselstyn Forks Over Knives gives a nice case example of that gentleman who responded well, the flagpole went up. Uh, Something's come up, Dr. Esselstyn, I think was the line in the movie. But you know, strong, strong signs we don't, we don't know for sure. But that's called the canary in the coal mine. Everybody's probably heard that. Miners used to bring a bird in a cage into the mine because if the bird plunked over and stopped singing, the carbon monoxide levels were high. Early warning that they should get out of the mine and let the air clear. Erectile dysfunction, according to the science, Two to three years after a man develops erectile dysfunction, the risk of a heart attack goes up substantially. In the area around Mayo Clinic, it's a county called Olmsted County, Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota. Uh, it's about an hour from Minneapolis. They've done research on that. And if you live in that county and you answer a questionnaire that I have erectile dysfunction, the risk in the next decade of having a heart attack is 10 times higher than men that say, I don't have erectile dysfunction. Why? Because erectile dysfunction, sexual dysfunction, it's a complex issue. It's one I'm pretty deep in in my clinic. You know, it can be hormonal, it could be diabetes, could be thyroid, could be very low testosterone or other testosterone abnormalities. Could be mechanical, people that go ride their bike 100 miles over and over and over can have injury or trauma. There are some deformities of the male organ, uh, not like Harvey Weinstein, but you know, a curvature. But in most cases, it's blood flow. I mean, of course, it could be relationship psychological. But in most cases, it's blood flow. And it's an early warning detection. Um, it may be that the artery below the waist is a little smaller than the artery above the waist. Maybe that the endothelium is a little more sensitive to injury than the endothelium in the coronary arteries. Uh, but uh, it is something not to be ignored. Again, the medical model is... Bob, I'm sorry to hear you're having some problem. Here's a prescription for generic Cialis, which is out now, a very effective drug, generally a very safe drug. But that interaction does nothing to really look at the root cause. Is there blood flow problems? Is there hormonal problems? Uh, even to ask if there's relationship problems. So um, that's where that CAT scan comes in. Uh, that's where lifestyle comes in. There's at least a suggestion. There isn't enough science that a diet rich in plant-based foods is the one most likely to promote good uh, sexual health for both men and women. Actually, fruit is, according to the science, if you go through the studies, uh, brightly colored berries and apples and melons is the food, pomegranates, most associated with good sexual health in the studies. Um, you know, the earlier in life you adopt a healthy lifestyle, the more likely you're not going to run into that problem. Uh, certain foods are the king. Of course, we all know chewing leafy greens many times a day. If you don't use, maybe you don't know this, Listerine and Scope. When you chew leafy greens, there's bacteria on the tongue that will convert the nitrates in your leafy greens to nitrites. You swallow them, they get absorbed, they become nitric oxide. It's a second mechanism to make more nitric oxide for better blood pressure, better energy, better heart function, and better sexual function. But if you use scope or Listerine or a really harsh antibiotic toothpaste, you actually may kill some of the bacteria on the tongue. And if you're having dental treatment and you have to do it, go ahead and do it. But every day, look for some natural uh, toothpaste or mouthwashes that don't have antibiotics and uh, antibacterials in them. Um, so leafy greens, watermelon, particularly the white rind of the watermelon. The original pathway that won the Nobel Prize in Medicine 22 years ago uh, for making nitric oxide was called the arginine citrulline pathway. And pine nuts, if you're willing to eat some nuts, are rich in arginine and citrulline. The white part of a watermelon is very rich in arginine and citrulline. Um, Beets, that's why beets and beetroots come up all the time for two reasons, arginine, citrulline, and also the dietary nitrates. And then there's this other chew your, you know, really chew and let this interaction happen in your mouth. It's an amazing system. Um, but don't ignore the system, focus on men's health, you know, prevent and try and reverse uh, all these issues. And, you know, it's very effective. A lot of guys will get some improvement. 
I do a strange procedure in my office called Gaines Wave. Some of you know what that is. It's a shock wave therapy for erectile dysfunction if diet, lifestyle, medication don't work. Um, but uh, that's uh, a topic for another day. I don't know why uh, Phil Hogan's name is on the Zoom call right in front of me. I don't know that that's a message from above, but I'm giving Phil a little hard time right now. Um, you know, so that just to summarize, you know, the data is guys go to the doctor far less than women. Guys get checked far less than women. Uh, not all women do it right, but more men don't do it right. Get labs, see a competent doctor. We have uh, at least a couple doctors on this call, I understand. There are, you know, I don't know that you have to see a plant-based primary care doc. Uh, I think it's an advantage. Um, I'll give you one last little tip here and then I'm done and we'll do questions. I'm big in blood work. I like to know if you're on a plant-based diet, how's your vitamin D level? What's your omega-3 level? Of course, cholesterol, blood sugar, kidney function, liver function. Um, some of you, you know, are really doing this well and you're still struggling. Why is my blood sugar up? You know, I'm really following Dr. Bernard's program and my blood sugar's up or uh, Robbie and Cyrus mastering diabetes. I've lately started measuring a mineral in the blood called chromium. And some of you are aware it's a mineral like calcium, magnesium. It's very important in blood sugar control. And I am blown away how many of my patients have zero chromium detectable in their uh, blood tests. And you can eat a lot of broccoli. Broccoli is actually the richest plant in chromium. Uh, but, you know, sometimes a supplement, when there's a proven deficiency, is reasonable. So I've been giving people a little extra chromium lately. There are some multivites. I, I have no interest in Dr. Furman's vitamin company, but his men and women's daily multivitamin does have chromium in it because he knew the literature and he uh, created a little supplement there. So eat broccoli or, you know, perhaps get checked if your blood sugar is a puzzle. So that's my plea for Men's Health Month. It's also Alzheimer's Awareness Month, which is why I uh, put the brain first. And I'll just say the last thing, since we have a few women on, on this interview YouTube I did last night with an amazing woman south of Charlotte, North Carolina, who had a heart attack at age 50 and now dedicates her life to teach, 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 and does it in a plant-based way. She said to me, it's not fair that you have Men's Health Month for a whole month. And there's one week in February that's called Women's Heart Week. What's the deal? And I said, well, that's obvious because it takes men four weeks to try and get to understand the importance of self-check awareness and health uh, checkups. And it only takes women a week to understand it. So I think it's actually a pretty fair ratio. All right. Well, there are questions here. Maybe I'll just go down and read them and, you know, Paul or I or Brett or anybody can answer. So one of the first questions from Mark was, I heard Dr. Osfeld suggest a cheat day every month on a plant-based program for various psychological reasons, your thoughts. And I'll answer that because I've been to Dr. Osfeld's program in the Bronx in Montevideo. I've sat with him while he teaches. Um, he's reaching an amazing audience, a inner city, lower economic mixed cultural racial group. Not all of them have heart disease. Most of them have diabetes and all the diseases, excuse me, obesity and all the diseases. You know, it's an amazing buy-in to get these people, to get anybody, but to get these people to jump. Because when you walk out of Montevideo <laughs> Medical Center, all you see, and I've done this, up and down every street, fast food junk of every kind, Oriental, Mexican, Seoul, Korean, Thai, and it's all fried food. I mean, I, I have this vision in my head how awful it is. So it's a big deal to get these people with serious medical uh, situations to buy into this amazing you know, response by going plant-based. I can see it being you know, an effective you know, negotiation and bargain. You know, do my way 29 days a month and you can go walk up and down the street one day a month. The other guy that talks about that a lot, if you ever have the time, is Penn Gillette, a Penn and Teller, who talks a lot about, he really has been able to focus for more than four years on a whole food plant-based diet that caused him to lose 100 pounds and uh, control his blood pressure. But he lets himself cheat one day a month. It's still a plant-based cheat, but it could be a donut. I mean, bad stuff, cookies. But he gets right back on the horse the next morning and says it doesn't feel all that bad. So. Anyways, I don't do that. I don't have a planned cheat day. I know Paul Chatlin talked about one planned cheat day a year, which was chocolate, which didn't agree with him. But 
you know, if, if that's what you got to do, it's better than cheating, you know, half the days a month. Um, Paul, there's a question I'll let you answer. Are the small group meeting in person again soon or yet? Oh, we answered already. Not yet. Sorry. There's a next question for uh, Joseph. Had a calcium index study with dye four years ago, two hey, arteries. Hey, Joel. Yeah. I'm, I apologize, but uh, on the small group, I want to encourage everybody to be part of a small group. Uh, but the, it's been a common question. The organ, when, when the organization feels as though their members will be safe, we will reopen up all activities, including small groups. That being said, I have heard of some small groups doing some like virtual picnics at a park where the individuals bring their own food, bring their own chairs, social distance, and you get to see the people we've been missing for so long. That's an idea that you can bring to your host. Uh, but right now, until further notice, uh, and it's really unfortunate because I miss you guys, uh, we are in lockdown and, and we're, we're going to stay that way until we feel safe. And, you know, just to yeah. let you know, we shut our organization down two weeks before anybody because look at our members, the great majority, 60 and older, underlying health condition. You got to be careful out there. Um, there are some questions that I maybe Brett or Paul or somebody already answered, which is awesome. Um, Mr. You know, one of the one of the participants said had a calcium score and an angiogram, two arteries, thirty percent. Oh, so there is a question. Do you recommend another test? Been plant based four years, so basically had some heart disease identified, didn't justify a bypass, didn't justify a stent. It's four years later, doing the diet. So let me just tell you this. Um, I have been lecturing lately using the newest, latest heart research and using it to really um, seal the deal that Ornish and Esselstyn are right. And most of us are going to say, of course, Ornish and Esselstyn are right. But everybody has critics. One of the criticisms is the largest paper Dr. Esselstyn has published is about 198 patients. The original study Dr. Ornish published was 48 patients. But subsequently, he added on thousands of patients that he submitted to Medicare to develop an Ornish intensive care cardiac rehab program, which is paid for by insurance. There actually is a new, I don't know if you guys want to know, you know, St. Joe's Mercy Ann Arbor, if you've had a stent recently, a bypass recently, a heart attack recently, angina, you can go to Ann Arbor and get in a Pritikin intensive cardiac rehab program. Well, they'll teach you whole food, plant-based diets, exercise, lifestyle management, and your insurance will pay for it. It's a much better, it's called cardiac rehab program than the standard cardiac rehab. You can't go because you want to, you gotta go because you've had a recent cardiac event. The other option is Dr. Ornish has insurance approval for a similar program. Well, there's only been one in the state of Michigan was with St. Joseph Mercy Ann Arbor. They're just open and we should probably have this cardiologist come to a meeting when we come back. Uh, in Flint, a cardiologist opened an Ornish intensive cardiac rehab program in his office in Flint. God bless him. Uh, I have his name in my phone. I'm blinking for a minute. Um, but so now we have two in the state of Michigan. Um, but let me just answer my question. Uh, in November 2019, the cardiology world was on fire because a new study was reported prelim preliminarily. And then the full study was published in April. It's called, and you should know this, it's called the ischemia study. Ischemia is a medical word. You could say ischemia, I wouldn't laugh at you. I-S-C-H-E-M-I-A. It's a Latin word for inadequate blood flow. And in 2007, a study was published called the Courage Study. Men at the VA, bad blockage in their heart, symptoms of angina, bad stress tests. It was called the Courage Study because they actually stopped the process and said half of you you're not gonna get a heart catheterization like Paul had. You're not gonna to go to stent and bypass. We're gonna put you on a better diet than average. God knows it wasn't PBNSG diet. We're gonna make you do some exercise and we're gonna put you on five different pills. And the other half, you're gonna get a cath, a bypass and a stent. When that published paper was published in 2007, there was no advantage to rushing to a stent or bypass compared to paying some attention to your diet and taking a lot of pills with some exercise, the courage study. Immediately, if you're a bypass surgeon or a stent cardiologist, of which I'm one of those, a stent cardiologist, 
you're going to say, oh, I'm not convinced. It, by the time the paper was studied, the equipment was out of date. Long story short, this new study said, let's repeat the study with the most modern technique. 5,179 men and women, bad chest pain, bad stress test, bad blockage. Whoa, we're not sending you all to calf stent or bypass. Half of you should follow a low saturated fat diet. Okay, it wasn't Ornish, it wasn't Esselstyn. They wanted them to eat a diet less than 7% of calories from saturated fat, which means get rid of the butter, get rid of the cheese, get rid of most of the meats if you're gonna try and follow that. Walk every day, take medication, and the other half right away went to calf stent and bypass. Published in April, 2020, what were the results? Three and a half years later, zero difference in death between early bypass stent versus not early bypass stent. Um, the overall picture of heart attacks, hospitalizations, there was no difference. Published in the New England Journal of Medicine. This should end the immediate reaction. You got chest pain, you got a bad stress test, you're going for a bypass or a stent because we now have two huge and impressive studies. So when Joe, one of the questionnaires says, I had a couple blockages two, uh, four years ago and I've been following the diet and I feel fine. Well, if you take that new data and say, if you feel fine, I don't even think you need a stress test. Based on the data, just keep doing what you're doing. I mean, it actually makes it hard now. So when do we ever check again? Because do we always wait for just you know, an emergency room admission? But the point is we have more data than ever that taking the time to change your lifestyle, add in a fitness program, maybe get on optimal medication with all the blood tests, it beats the heck out of these big procedures, or at least it, it ties the big procedures. And to me, it absolutely vindicates Ornish and Esselstyn, but with much bigger data and much bigger splash. What's the problem? Cardiologists are ignoring it and cardiac surgeons are ignoring it. So I'm hoping that maybe one system like Kaiser in California that likes plant-based nutrition and has to pay for all the care for everybody with doctors on salary will say, well, we're going to actually put that program into practice. Everybody gets a second opinion before you go on to bypass your stents. And if you meet the criteria, you don't get a bypass or stent. So Mr. Joe, just keep doing what you're doing. Go look up the ischemia study. I've written a few articles about it because I think it's fundamentally, you know, paradigm changing, but it's also getting ignored. Cool. And, yeah. You, you see Mark Coyle's question? Yeah, that just came in, the last one. Yeah. In a plant-based diet address arteries that have already been stented in January. Um, and three other, yeah. Uh, that was three stents for one area. So the answer is, um, you know, if you've had stents 20 years ago or four months ago, should you adopt a whole food plant-based diet? And the answer is, has that exact study been done? No, but the answer is obviously strongly yes. Because even if you've had three or four stents, these are little spot welds. These are, you know, the, the longest stent, the longest stent is maybe an inch long. Most are about three quarters of an inch long. But you've got inches and inches of heart arteries. So given that the new stents are pretty good, you're not as worried about the stent. And we don't know what a plant-based diet does to the endothelium inside the stent, which takes months and months to grow. It takes a little while for that lawn to come back after we've squashed everything. But you really worry about half a centimeter this way, half a centimeter that way. Um, you absolutely want to, because you know, I used to train with a cancer doctor in Ann Arbor long ago. He used to talk about cancer like raisin bread. You can pick one, but there's always another raisin at the end of the loaf. Heart disease is a little bit of an analogy. Boom, 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 stent spot welds. But if you're young and you got a lot of years ahead of you, you got a lot of raisins you should be worrying about. Little soft black up and down the artery. And yes, you're probably gonna need a statin. And yes, you're gonna need a cardiac rehab program. I would think about Ornish in Flint or Pritikin in Ann Arbor. But um, uh, a whole food plant-based diet would be absolutely the only choice to consider. Thank you. Um, there is a question, due to the concern to get enough protein, I eat yogurt, what do you advise? That's a question from Norm. I actually just wrote, do you guys know a website called Live Kindly? Uh, yeah. Livekindly.co, it's, you know, we've got good ones now. We've got ForksOverKnives.com and what are some of the other, you know, plant-based um, news. No, how about, um, what's how the about one? How about PBNSG.org, right? <laughs> I can't hear you, Paul, I can't hear you. Paul, you're muted. Okay, uh, 
eat, live. What's that? What's uh, Jeff? Do you know that one or, or Brett? Uh, there's a really good one. Uh, you know what? Well, anyway, for those of you who've never been, I don't own it. There's an Australian based website called livekindly.co, livekindly.co. It's not .com. And anyways, they publish a lot of good stuff. I've started to write for them. They have over a million people on Facebook. So you reach a lot of people, um, good people behind it. They actually just, they're going into the plant-based food business too. They got an interesting model. So I just wrote an article two weeks ago on a new research study about um, plant-based protein versus animal-based protein and long-term health. And the um, answer to your question, Norm, to some extent is, Study after study after study, Harvard, University of Southern California, is plant-based protein seems to be more associated with lower risk of cancer, heart disease, diabetes. Eat your beans, eat your grains, eat your peas, eat your lentils, uh, eat, uh, you know, uh, eat your tofu, it's perfectly fine to eat, you know, tofu tempeh. You're gonna get the protein you want. You know, nobody knows if you need a plant-based protein powder, there's no science to say you do. There are some good organic plant-based ones, but there's no reason. Um, is yogurt evil? And I'll give a fair answer. Dr. Esselstyn obviously didn't include yogurt in his program. When Dr. Ornish did his series of studies, which began in 1985, when there weren't whole food stores, he did let people eat non-fat dairy to give them some options besides just peas and beans. And he still was able to show a lot of remarkable you know, uh, recovery of health in a variety of his situations. I don't advise my patients to eat yogurt. Uh, there are a variety of, you know, plant-based yogurts now, some of which are nearly absent oils and fats and sugars. You want to avoid the sugary yogurts. Um, so, so delicious and so many of the other companies. So I'm not going to guilt you out about it, but I do want to maybe reframe the issue. Is your focus on getting protein from dairy necessary? It isn't, and you can get it lots of other places. Yes, two, th two things on that. One is uh, the, the website I want everyone to write down is Eat Plants Love. Whole food, huh. plant-based, they're like forks over knives, and they are brand new, and they have a lot of great recipes. Okay. To answer the question on the yogurt, you know, recently I've tried uh, silk tofu, and then I throw in fruit and whip it all up. And guess what it tastes like? Good yogurt. yogurt. So you don't need to have no fat, high fat yogurt. Yeah. If you need the yogurt, try silky tofu. If you want to sweeten it just a little bit, uh, put some stevia, a little bit on it if you want, then load up the fruits, have a blast. And Paul, uh, for people that maybe don't know, soy-based foods, edamame, tempeh, tofu, miso soup, have every amino acid. It's called a complete protein. You don't have to worry about that. But if you want to, you know, up the odds that you're absolutely nutritionally complete, soy-based products are, you know, a, a guaranteed way to get all these amino acids that build, um, you know, good protein and, you know, are the backbone of a lot of our health. All right. Any, any final questions from anybody? Okay. Uh, my final question is, Dr. Khan. Yes, Paul. Thank you. And uh, how's the restaurant doing? <laughs> You're so sweet. We, uh, we did reopen our remaining toehold in the food industry. You know, it's tough. I mean, in season hasn't reopened. They've got some issues going on. God bless Amber has and Shimmy Shack and Karen Conschultz, who's not a relative, but feels like a blood relative. We're back open in Royal Oak. Business is picking up every day. We actually had our best day in, you know, maybe two weeks today. But it's awkward, you know? Everybody's wearing masks and physically distanced. Uh, you know, the restaurant industry is not a fun industry right now. And uh, it's gonna be very hard for big restaurants to, you know, make it happen. Uh, bars are always gonna do well. The bars are packed, you know, whether that's good for the safety of the community or not is unknown. Certainly welcome everybody. And any feedback on Green Space and Go is obviously welcome, but thank you. Right, and then uh, I wanna thank everybody Hopefully this is what you uh, were hoping for. We'll do this again. And again, please uh, be part of PPNSG, volunteer, donate, get involved, and know that as soon as we could have a meeting, we could have a small group, I can't wait. Okay, so, but in the meantime,
please be aware. Uh, I did get a job offer recently as the czar of social distancing. I turned it down, <laughs> but uh, I want to just share with everybody, please watch what's around you. Be careful. Mask up when you can and stay safe. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Paul. You. Thanks, Dr. Khan. Appreciate no, it. I'm going to post that uh, protein article on this train right now. Cool. Yeah, one last bit of information. We hold a monthly uh, small group meeting online now for all small groups or anybody that's wanting to join a small group um, or be part of it. So we're doing just like one big group, small group every month. So if you go on our website, it's on the home page and you'll see the list of dates. So if anybody wants to join us, it's kind of like this, you know, it's kind of like a small group. Just sit and chat and have a good time. Good deal. Cool, cool. Thank you. All right, you guys. Thank you. Everybody have a good night.